and welcome into Body Language. My name is Edgar Champagne. My guest is Dr. Michael Malone. He was here last week. We got him to stay over and do another segment. We had so many questions we wanted to ask him because we don't get opportunities to have this wealth of knowledge on the camera as often as we'd like. So, what is your body telling you? What is your body saying to you? That's what body language is all about. And Dr. Malone, again, for people who missed last week, talk about how you got started and the locations of your different offices, please. Sure, so I got started uh, in this region in uh, 2005. Uh, I joined my father in practice. Uh, we have two locations uh, right across the street from the medical center. Now it's Piedmont Hospital, uh, 2039 10th Avenue, and also in Phoenix City, uh, 1610 Opelika Road. Mm -hmm. And then in the last year, uh, in Eufaula, Alabama, wow. 610 uh, Broad Street. So we're, we're actually practicing rural medicine there. Uh, I grew up in this community. I've been here since I was in third grade. My dad was military. Uh, and it's just been uh, a tremendous experience to be able to come back home. Uh, you know, you, you spend your whole life going to school, uh, being trained, uh, and, and also watching uh, from kind of a trailblazing dad in, in terms of, my dad was the first African-American OBGYN in Columbus. And uh, he recruited uh, the likes of Dr. Eldridge, Dr. McCray, Dr. Chambers uh, to Columbus. And to see those guys operate, uh, it's, it's just been a, a tremendous experience. Wow, incredible, okay. Well, uh, last week we talked about a lot of uh, helpful things. This week we're gonna, I guess, dive deeper. Uh, first question comes from a lady by the name of Shay. And uh, her question is, what foods should I avoid during pregnancy, Dr. Malone? Sure. So, you know, when it comes to that, that's, there's, a, there's a couple of things that, that we look at. Uh, we, we talked about this in our first segment, that common sense is, is not always common. So you want to have a common sense approach. So th things that you normally would eat um, are probably going to be pretty... Uh, okay in pregnancy. There are rarely things that uh, we absolutely don't want you to eat, okay? Like when it comes to fish, because we're in a region where a lot of people eat uh, fish and we're near the Gulf, um, you know, catfish, of course, is great. It's mm -hmm. on the great list. There's some things that are on the good list, and there's some things that we just don't want you to eat. Uh, uh, the, the don't want you to eat list is going to be like tile fish and mackerel and swordfish. Those aren't things that are like indigenous to like lakes around here, no, obviously. Not very common. But, but uh, they have high mercury levels. And, and that's really what people are getting at. It's, it's, it's the high mercury levels mm -hmm. that, that have um, been detrimental to pregnancies. But for the most part, um, you know, when, when it comes to food, there aren't too many things. You, you want a well-balanced diet. Uh, you know, oftentimes you're not in the best mood uh, when you first find out you're pregnant in terms of not, not you're excited about being pregnant, obviously, but mood in terms of some cravings that you may have uh, get, get uh, enhanced, okay? So one of the things that we talk about in terms of wellness and diet, um, you wanna have a balanced diet. So you wanna think about your body in terms of what's the best thing you can put in your body. Not just the anything. What's the best thing? Because it's not just about you anymore. It's about the baby as well. Mm -hmm. And so, so you you got to think about. You know, there are certain mo mornings you may wake up and you're like, I don't normally eat breakfast, but now you're going to do it for the baby. Because what I try to tell my patients, if the baby were in the high chair right now, yeah, you would be in tune to it. You every hour now, you know, you wouldn't look at the child and say, Hey, did you eat today, Grandma? Did you feed the baby today? You'd be on it. Yeah. Let's not wait for the baby to be in the high chair. Mm -hmm. Let's do it right now. Okay. And so think about it in terms of that. Now, the patients will tell you, but I don't feel like eating. I'm nauseated. Well, let's address that. Let's figure out why. Early on in pregnancy, it's foreign to the body. Your body, if you go to a picnic and food doesn't agree with you, you're going to feel like you're going to be nauseated to the point of vomiting sometimes, right? So pregnancy has that same effect on moms. So there's certain things that we can do around uh, hydration and certain medications that will help with nausea. But as we move forward, there are going to be certain things that you're going to crave. If you go in any little market around here, you can buy white dirt, chalk. Now, to you and I, it looks like chalk. Uh, it's actually porcelain, right? And so we don't advocate for you eating white dirt. But patients will come in, I, I just can't put it down. So, so I have to also tell them, well, okay, so if, if we can't come to an agreement, um, I got to tell you how it can affect your baby. 
And uh, oftentimes when we talk about iron deficiency and stuff like that, uh, they, they get the idea. But uh, it doesn't make you a bad mom or anything, but you just want to be educated so that you're making conscious decisions. Well, w uh, I was listening to you talk about how a woman's body changes and everything. Well, if a large person becomes pregnant, will they have a large baby? Uh, not necessarily, but there are some morbidities, comorbidities that are associated with, with obesity. And so the weight gain typically in a mom that is pregnant is about 25 pounds. But if you're already overweight uh, or your BMI is high, let's just put it that way, body mass. Um, your body mass, you, you're, you're not expected to gain as much weight. Mm -hmm. So you're, you may not gain 25 pounds. Now, obviously, things, these, these are just averages. Uh, but but um, there are some comorbidities that are associated with that in terms of diabetes and hypertension that we want to get ahead of early on. Okay. Well, let me ask you this question, and this will be the last one in this segment. Marjorie wants to know, uh, is it safe to have sex in pregnancy, and when should it be cut off, Dr. Malone? Sure. So um, sex in pregnancy is, is perfectly okay, unless there are some issues that are associated with the pregnancy. Now, number one, if you have any risk of preterm labor, uh, that being uh, bleeding, um, preterm contractions, uh, Anything that has anything to do with the cervix, I advocate for n no sexual activity. Um, but sex in pregnancy is, is perfectly normal. As, as a matter of fact, later on in pregnancy, uh, it actually can be one of the causes of labor, okay? Um, because uh, sexual intercourse, what men have in them uh, is natural pitocin, okay? And that can actually soften the cervix later on in, in pregnancy. Now. My patients out there may not, may not have wanted me to tell the fellas that, uh, but but uh, this is an old wives' tale that actually has some phy physiology behind it, and um, and this is why, you know, grandparents would say, you know, uh, you could put yourself into natural labor this way. So it is safe, unless there are some issues that are associated uh, with preterm labor, uh, and then we would abstain from intercourse. Anything that's uh, that can put you at risk for having the baby too early, having an infection. Uh, we certainly would, um, you know, even if it's a, a situation where preterm contractions associated with intercourse, uh, I would advocate using uh, a condom because of just for that reason, for the Pitocin that's in, uh, in males that can cause those contractions. Got a couple, of, I'm gonna ask you some quick rapid questions here. About, take a guess about how many babies you think you've delivered. Well, I've, I've, wow. So it's been a couple thousand for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, we, are, we, there, we, are there special we, days that babies come along? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, for me, for me, it's every day. Uh, you know, if, if if my wife could tell you that, uh, but but you know, not really. There's been some anecdotal stories about full moons and rising tides. Yes, sir. But uh, I, I liken it to when people engage in, in social activity. So in the winter months, mm -hmm. uh, you think about 10 months after that is like late summer, early spring, I mean, early fall. Uh, we, we seem to have a little spike in the numbers. Um, but, but, but outside of that, not really, okay. not really. Good. Good. It's pretty even. My special guest right now is Dr. Michael Malone, a personal friend of mine with three clinics in the Chattahoochee Valley, one in Eufaula, one in Phoenix City, Alabama, and one in Columbus. We'll come back after a break and get those locations for you. We'll talk about how you can see Dr. Malone and his father and other issues with OBGYN. Stay with us. You're on CTV Beam Body Language. Don't go away. I guess sometimes things just happen. Devastating things. It's got nothing to do with fairness. Bam. Your whole world changes in an instant. And you never see it coming. That's what happened to me. The day my mother had a stroke. I'm Paul George, and I want you to learn the signs of a stroke fast. F-A-S-T. F. Face drooping. A. Arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Because the sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in their recovery. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke. F-A-S-T, fast. 
Welcome back to Body Language. My name is Edgar Champagne. You're on the show that listens to your body. What is your body telling you? You know, when you feel a certain ache or an ailment in your body, it's, it's actually talking to you. So what is your body telling you? My special guest right now is Dr. Michael Malone. Dr. Malone, in the first show, you told us that you went to Meharry and you went to Wayne State in yes, Detroit. Sir. How do you doctors stay abreast of uh, new information coming down? What, what do you all pay attention to? Well, you know, we're, we're a member of um, several different organizations, and those organizations will send you updates on the latest technologies, um, the latest trends, and the latest scientifically challenged studies. Mm -hmm. uh, you get that in peer articles that, that come every month. Uh, but, but routinely what we uh, set out to do is attend conferences because then you're, you're getting uh, people who are practicing medicine all over the country and the world and you're getting a chance to witness how they practice medicine and you can take what you've heard and apply it to your community because as you know, uh, in medicine, even in radio, it's not one size fits all. That's right. And and if we play, if if, if we play to that, if we if we if if if, if you're wanting to go to a doctor who's a cookbook, right? If this happens, then this happens. If this happens, then that happens. And everything is cookie cutter, then then you can't come to me, mm -hmm. um, because I I've got to tailor my approach uh, to who I'm dealing with. Um, I deal in a, in a community. Uh, that's underserved, um, and uh, but that community demands the utmost respect, um, the highest quality of care, care, and I can't provide that unless I'm up to breast. Uh, if I'm if I'm not up to speed on the latest, mm -hmm. because one thing, as you know, Edgar, our patients are a lot smarter than we were at that age. Sure and information is coming at them at, at a rapid pace. And so when that information is coming at them at a rapid pace, I've got to keep up, mm -hmm. all right? Because I'm, I'm not going up against that patient in the room, I'm going up against Google, <laughs> up to date. Speaking and, of keeping up in, with the robots, and they have these tubes that can go up in a person's body, you all are uh, uh, equipped with that, correct? Sure, Do sure. any of your patients object to that? Or are they nervous about that? Uh, no, you know, when, when it comes to robotics and laparoscopic, uh, you know, minimally invasive surgery, uh, you know, they may not know all the technical advances, and, and I don't imagine anyone would unless you were in trained field, to do yeah. it in the field, but they know the outcome, mm -hmm. you know. Um, there's a whole lot that goes on inside of a body, but the patient usually just sees the skin, right? And so I always learned from my dad that, you know, when I first came out of training, they trained us to staple all skin incisions. And it was, had a lot to do with speed. Uh, because when you're training and you're learning, uh, the person who's training you just wants to teach you, train you, and get you on out of there. But, you know, when you get home, uh, back to Columbus, Georgia, Phoenix City <laughs> area, uh, you know, my dad used to always have this thing about, you know, learn what you can, but we're going to deprogram you when you get down here. And so you learn early on that the patient sees those staples. And my dad used to always say, you know, that's one less hurt. So you, you apply the staples, it doesn't hurt you at all. But you have to remove them, you're going to see the patient kind of flinch. Mm -hmm. He said, put a stitch in, make it look nice. This is what the plastic surgeons do. You can do the same thing. You have that skill set. And if you don't, we'll train you. And that's the only thing the patient sees. Now, the patient doesn't see all the technological advances that it went through before that, because all they see is the skin. But make it nice. Mm -hmm. And that kind of mentality has taken me a long way. You mentioned C-section. What is happening when a woman can't give the natural childbirth through the vagina uh, with the pressure and everything, what 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 is going on there? Right. Well, so so labor is a is is, is a very tough experience for yes, anyone. Sir. Okay. So um, you know it's it's one of the things that um, obstetrics can be looked upon like this: hours and hours of boredom. You're just waiting. You're just waiting for the baby to come. Waiting for the baby to come. Followed by moments of sheer terror. Mm -hmm. Now, in those moments of sheer terror, it could be the loss of heartbeat of the baby, it could be bleeding, uh, it could be precipitous labor where the baby just says, you know what, I'm one centimeter dilated, but right now I feel like coming out. Mm. And everything is not prepared for that at that moment. 
but you have to be prepared. Sure. Your nursing staff has to be prepared. Your hospital has to be prepared. So you're hoping that all these things are happening with the team. But to what you were, to were asking me about, you know, when, when we do what we do in terms of um, the profession, you, you kind of have to be prepared for that, all right, and, and, and no matter what the situation is. And so, uh, you know, experience trains you to be there and, and be ready. Uh, and so if a woman is going through labor, she has to know that there are certain percentages. First time out, you know, you might only have uh, a 20 percent chance of having a C-section. But those patients now that want to be induced, that rate may be higher, okay? Our percentage rate is like less than 10 percent. And my dad's is probably even lower than mine because he always has this thing of the baby's not going to come out until the, the apple doesn't fall off the tree until it's ripe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a ripened cervix is going to give you a better chance of having yeah. a vaginal delivery. <laughs> However, that may come later on in the pregnancy. And induction rates in, in nationwide now uh, have, have changed because 38, 39 weeks was at about the time when uh, as at the time when we can induce your labor. Now, a mom may want to be induced at 36 weeks, 37 weeks, 38 weeks, 39 weeks, but even at 39 weeks, if nothing has happened, if it's a pond with no splash, you know, and I have to bring on that splash, meaning I have to bring on the contractions, go into the lab and do all these things to help bring your baby or dilate your cervix, it's not as natural as natural labor. So natural labor is going to give you a better chance of having a vaginal delivery. If I go into and you say, Dr. Malone, just bring my baby out today, it's not like the drive through yes, sir. where I can just order food and pick it up around the corner. Yes, sir. It's going to take a while. It could take a day. It could take two days. Young people don't want to do that. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that their mothers may have taken three to four days to have a vaginal delivery. These children want the baby out in eight hours. And, and that increases anxiety, increases stress, and it, all around right, in the room of a patient that you're dealing with, all these things, and that has increased our C-section rate. Yeah, yeah. I'll try to get you to smile with this little story as we take a break. <laughs> when I was in Mississippi, uh, the old people would tell us, well, uh, when a little baby is born, when they start crawling, you put a baseball, a basketball, and a football <laughs> on the ground, and whatever one the, the child goes to, that's what they're going to be, they're going to sure. play, right? Sure. And uh, they said, I crawl toward a beer can, the alcoholic. <laughs> uh, okay. I, I don't drink anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> Good. We're going to come back with our last segment with Dr. Michael Maloney in just a little bit. Stay with us. This is Body Language, ladies and gentlemen, on CTV Beam. Don't go away. It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes. You can do it here. But you probably won't. You're busy. Kids, work. Show coming back in 48 seconds. So let's do this now. Hold up one finger if you're a man. Women, zero. Three more fingers if you're over 60, two over 50, one over 40. If you're not sure, keep in mind you're sitting on a couch right now, so one more finger if you're not very active. One finger if yes, zero if no. One yes, zero no. Next, find the body type that looks most like you and hold up that many fingers while I look around awkwardly. And that's it. If you're holding up five fingers or more, you probably have prediabetes. Sorry to be so blunt, but hey, you're busy. Just go to the site. Welcome back to Body Language, Edgar Champagne, and my special guest, Dr. Michael Malone. We're in the month of December. It's getting close to the holidays. Dr. Malone, people are going to be traveling. Uh, what advice do you give people who are expecting right now during holiday travel? Well, frequent breaks, uh, you know, that's real important. Uh, you know. The size of a mom's bladder was probably a grapefruit before pregnancy. Sometimes it feels like a grape <laughs> during pregnancy. Uh, so frequent stops, staying hydrated. Oftentimes you'll find patients that will say, you know what, I'm, I'm getting on that road. I don't want them to stop every 15 minutes where I feel the urge to go to the bathroom. But if you do that, you're going to be dehydrated because, you're, because they're going to say, you know what, I'll go to the bathroom less if I drink less water. Mm -hmm. Then they're going to get dehydrated. The first thing that we do in, in, in triage when we see pregnant moms pretty much is start an IV because we know that so many moms are dehydrated, even under the best circumstances. So you can imagine with travel, staying hydrated and frequent breaks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let me ask you this one. 
for you and your father and your three different clinics, you, you said you practicing rural medicine in Eufaula, and some yes, of these sir. people are, uh, I don't want to say, well, I, I won't even say it, but there are some people who are less fortunate, Yes, in a sense. What does a female need to have to be able to get access for health care from you and your clinic? Well, so I would say, out. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sound light about this, but a friendly face, mm -hmm. okay? Because we're, we're dealing with not just one life, but two lives. If a woman has decided to go down this road, I mean the life road, because you got choices. Even in the state of Alabama, you got choices. But I'm in the life business, sure. right? So when you come see me, we're, we're having a baby, okay? You're risking your life. I don't want the access to care to hinder that, meaning paperwork, insurance, Medicaid, whatever it is. We, we can work it out. Get in to see us. Let's meet. I may not be your favorite doctor, but I can get you to see someone. But let's get you the access to care that you deserve. Remember, you're risking your life to bring life into the world. We should not be like a third world country in terms of the, the rates. I mean, some third world countries actually beat us in mortality rates. It doesn't make any sense. So I like to get you in early and often, and then we're going to have a positive outcome. Or at least we're going to have the best outcome we could have, not just the any outcome. Remember, we talked about this earlier in terms of what goes in your body. We want the best nutrients to go in your body, not right. just the any nutrients. Right. You, we have choices, right? And so when you choose to bring this life into the world, let's, let's give it the best go we can. Now, you might say, well, Dr. Willen, when I got to your office, I didn't have this, I didn't have that. It doesn't matter. We'll work it out. We'll work it out. Now, my staff is probably in my ear saying, what in the world, what in the world? But, but they know we have much positive outcomes. Speaking of your staff, give them a shout out. Who are some of the people that sure, work with your Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, of course, I'd, I'd be remiss without mentioning my father, um, uh, who, who the reason I'm here today. Uh, but in my office, uh, we have uh, two nurses, uh, Tammy uh, and Jolanda. Okay. Tammy and Jolanda. Uh, and uh, and they're very. And our, we have a front office staff and, and Natalie. Uh, and so uh, you know, everyone in my office has to know um, that it 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 starts obviously with us, and, and it kind of trickles down. But everyone has to feel the same, has to be enthusiastic the same way that I am. Um, because, it, you know, it's, it's like when you, when, if you go to a restaurant and, and you see the waiter or the waitress come, come at your table and they just look like they don't feel like being there, you may not want to eat at their restaurant. Correct. You know, I want folks to be like, right, you come to my office, you're going to hear music. Uh, you know, when I do a C-section, you're going to hear music. Uh, it, it's going to be whatever music that person wants. I mean, whatever it is that makes you feel comfortable, because, Edgar, you and I can't have a baby. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm all, my job is to get you the most positive outcome as possible and, and, and keep your wits about you. What's, the, what's the, the, the brown skin lady, the older lady that works in the office uh, right there at the receptionist counter? Yes. Oh, so and, and my, oh, and, and, oh, and, and, my I, and, I, and I'd be remiss. So I, I, when I mentioned Jolanda and Tammy, I mentioned uh, uh, Phoenix City. In my Columbus office, Miss Chester. Okay. And Miss Chester has been with my dad over 30 years. Miss Chester is the warmest person in the world. <laughs> when I was trying to book you for this show, I called and uh, she said, well, they don't come in until 2 o'clock. But I said, well, are you there at the office right now? Are you on location? She said, yes. So I went by to see her. And I, I forgot her name. But Miss Chester, I said, well, can you please call uh, Michael for me and everything? Because I know he, he's a personal friend of mine. We worked on campaigns together and everything else. Get Michael on the phone. She said, well, no, I'll give you his number. You know, and so what you're saying is right. It trickles down from you and your dad. Absolutely. The warmth and the, and the concern and the care and the compassion Absolutely. about what you do. Uh, it Marvelous. has to. You, you can't do this. If, if it's, it's the same thing in your profession. Yeah. You know, we, we've, always, we've always seen you all these years, and you've always been consistent. Thank you. Appreciate and it. it's one of those things where, you know, when you hear the voice, you know who you're dealing with. Yeah, yeah. Right? One last quick question. Uh, Kate Middleton in England. Yes. Whenever she was pregnant with their first child and the second child, they said that they had to take her off her feet. What could possibly be the advice of a doctor having a woman have to get off their feet, doc, because uh, in fear of losing a baby or something? Sure. So one of the risks that you have, and in, in obviously in pregnancy, is, is delivering too soon, mm. uh, what we call preterm labor. So anytime you have a baby before 
37 weeks, we, we, we continue preterm. Uh, in, in Kate Middleton's approach, uh, uh, in her particular pregnancy, I'm not exactly sure um, if she had any of her earlier uh, children early, but it may have been something that they picked up. Part of going to see uh, your gyneco oh, obstetrician gynecologist is kind of pick up clues that may either, you know, tell you how the, what the future is going to hold in terms of uh, your blood pressure, uh, checking glucose in, in, in your blood, but also checking the cervix. Okay, so when I do an ultrasound, I can kind of evaluate your cervix. And if you haven't had a history of preterm labor, what if I picked up on the fact that your cervix is shortened? In Kate Middleton's uh, situation, I, I'm not exactly sure, but if her cervix was shor shortened, the recommendation may have been to stay on bed rest. And uh, we often tell patients uh, that have a shortened cervix, you're going to need, need to be on bed rest and pelvic rest. So we have to tell dads, look, you know, there's nothing against you personally, but we're trying to get her as far along as we can because we're noticing that the cervix is starting to shorten. Because we know that if, if there's no cervix, it's kind of like a drain in your tub that the baby's going to deliver. And we don't want the baby coming too soon mm. uh, because that runs all sorts of risks. And so our goal is to get you so that when the mom leaves home, the baby leaves home too. Mm -hmm. But in the event that we go into preterm labor, Piedmont Hospital is adequate, adequately equipped to handle preterm babies. And it's one of those things where uh, when you look at the community, we have a top-notch program there uh, that allows our babies to stay here and not have to all be shipped out. Um, because it, and it used to be that. Dr. Michael Malone, my special guest for an hour. We're very, very honored and privileged to be able to have this kind of information dispensed to the Chattahoochee Valley. Uh, Dr. Malone and his father have three clinics, OBGYN clinics, one in Eufaula, one in Columbus, Georgia, and one in Phoenix City. They are very easy to reach. What's the phone number, Doc? Yeah, so the Columbus office is 706-324-2485. Mm -hmm. Our Phoenix City office is 334 448 8200, uh, I'm sorry, 334-448-4444. Mm -hmm. I gave you the, the fax number, the first one. And then in Eufaula, it's 334-448-4218. Okay, we're gonna post those numbers on camera. Thank you for watching uh, CTV Beam with Body Language, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for, uh, have a good holiday. We'll be right back next week with another show. Mm -hmm.